I flew with a lot of with a lot of guys in Vietnam and a lot of guys flew with me meaning that when I was co-pilot I flew with them you had to be co-pilot for some time to learn the tactics the ropes the area the frequencies they actually expected you to listen to three goddamn radios at once the FM to talk to the Fox Mike to talk to the ground troops, the UHF to talk to other slicks, the VHF to talk to the guns, and there'd be three conversations going at once a lot of the time. As I've said uh, before, that when I first got there, that the only thing I heard was an unintelligible swirl of bullshit. It was like a foreign language. And you had to learn how to do that. And it was important that you did, because if you miss something, somebody might die. And, um, but I flew, and I'm terrified I'm gonna leave somebody out. And if there's an error of omission, I apologize, but I'll start by saying that everybody I flew with there, I have the greatest respect for. We were all out there every day doing our damnedest to do our best. Uh, but guys like in, in the 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 slicks like T D Moon and um, the or fantastic pilots. Um, a, a guy by a nickname of he called, we called, everybody had a nickname. Might have been one, what, how you looked or whatever. But uh, this guy's nickname was Penis. Because from the side, he looked like a damn penis. That's what everybody thought. I never did see it. I'm sorry, Penis. <laughs> there was Hudkins. There was Hawkins. He was Hawk. Hawk was great. Uh, Samson. Klimazuski. He was Clem. Uh, another great pilot and a great friend uh, was uh, David Parrish. He was a fantastic slick pilot. And um, as I say, there were many more. There was Lieutenant Burke that be named, be, uh, became known as Stoney because of Rodeo Rider television program at the time. And uh, Lieutenant Rock, uh, uh, Baby Huey, and all, all these guys. And, the, and then the Crocs, they were all slicks. And then the Crocodiles, uh, there was Richard Gill that we call Waldo because he had kind of a walrus-type mustache that he grew. Uh, there was... Bob Vickery, um, Bob Apgar, who is a great friend yet today and lives in California, and uh, Jim McDonald that I mentioned before, um, Jerry Miller, called him Jer, and um, Dick Harbors, he was called Tricky Dick. My nickname, by the way, was Pigpen. When I got initiated into the Crocs, everybody did. They come roaring into my room, faking that they were all drunk and, and, and drinking watered-down rot-gut whiskey, but the, what they were giving me was not watered-down. <laughs> and they strewed it in my room with beer cans and whiskey bottles. And I woke up in the morning with a vomit necktie and a horrible headache laying on my back fully dressed on my bunk. Very early the next morning, they all roared in there again, snapping pictures. And they said, well, my God, we know what your nickname's going to be. Look how messy your room is. You're in pig pens, but you are. And once you got assigned a nickname, that was it. There was no negotiation. And if you 
squawked about it, you would just be subjected to unmerciful brazzing. So that was my nickname, Crocodile Tour Pig Pen. Uh, there were gall, a guy by the name of Galogly, a great guy. Everybody, nobody could pronounce his name, so they called him Golly Golly. Uh, there was Paul Banish. Everybody liked Paul. He was Chipmunk. And uh, the. Um, can we go? Cut for a minute. I'm going to think there's some more people. I can't leave any of these guys out. Um, uh, shoe Fly. Uh, where in the hell did they left you fly? And Rademacher. Okay, just go ahead and start again. Me. John John? Yeah, John John. Yeah. <laughs> there was, there was uh, John Van Leer uh, named John John, and everybody liked John John. And, um, there was there was um, Captain Jeff Weller who was the platoon leader until he left and John John took over. Uh, and uh, there was um, uh, Rademacher, call him Rad. They were all great guys and great pilots. And w near the end of my tour, a special mention. Uh, should go to a commissioned officer. He was the first lieutenant. His name was James Softly, and everybody knew him as Shoe Fly because they couldn't pronounce his name either. And he wound up flying as my co-pilot uh, several times, and I immediately recognized a a, a natural ability in him to handle an aircraft and a, a natural command and i was quite impressed with him he picked up what i taught him very quickly and he would um I, when i first met him uh my nickname had become magnet ass because i was taking so many hits Bob Robbie Apgar gave that to me and it stuck. And I would come back from flying one day and here was Jim Softly or Shoe Fly. I first met him, shook his hand, we were in the croc hooch and, and and he just got there and I said, uh, you take any hits yet, uh, Jim? And he said, no, not in Vietnam, but did in flight school. <laughs> I said, what? Well, evidently he was flying, and I'm almost certain I have this right, that it was softly. He was flying into a farmer's field in Alabama at Fort Rucker, and some farmer took fence, uh, hit him a couple times the tail boom, I think, with a 30 odd six. <laughs> it absolutely cracked me up. I said, shoe fly, you haven't got a chance in hell over here if you take hits in Alabama. <laughs> But, but he was a fantastic uh, co-pilot, and I think he, I left, and I've lost touch with Jim. But he was, uh, I considered him a, really an asset. Jack Cloud was another fantastic croc pilot. Uh, he flew as my co-pilot uh, a lot of times. Uh, before shoe fly and the other guys got there and you could always depend on jack i mean always depend on him he had the nicest smile he was great with these vietnamese kids and um he's just an all-around great guy and, and another guy that really deserves special mention remembering that all of them were really good and, but I just happened to fly with Rick Gill, winging on him 
more than anybody else for some reason. And this is who we call Waldo or Crocodile 4. And I was Croc 2 or Pig Pen or Magnet Ass. Take your pick. <clears throat> and Rick Gill, in my opinion, Waldo was just natural. He was un... You didn't fluster him. He never got... He never got... Uh, it, it was just stable all across the board, even when the crap was really flying. He made great decisions. He was always there for you. You could always depend on him covering you. He would he would always get your six. And I always tried to get his six. And apparently we did. And um, an interesting story about that is uh, we lost touch with one another in, when we left the Army. And uh, we thought, we had heard through other sources that each of us were dead. Well, it wound up being that, like Mark Twain said, the reports of his death had been extremely exaggerated. Um, I happened to be seeing a, a doctor at a VA, and Waldo had lived within two and a half hours of me for years, and we didn't even know it. And he came to this same doctor one day at the VA and said, he used to fly with a guy from uh, Southern Illinois. His name was Mark Garrison. His dad was a chiropractor. And well, this doctor knew immediately who he was talking about because I was a patient of his too. But he couldn't say anything because of HIPAA health Information Portability and Privacy Act. But he called me, the doctor did, and I said he had this guy in, uh, said he flew with him, and I said, well, who is it? And he said, I can't tell you <laughs> for the same reasons. And he said, but I can uh, give you, uh, see if, uh, give some phone numbers in, in a certain way. Somehow he did it. Would you like me to do that so you guys can get in touch? And I said, yeah, God, I'd like to talk to him. I flew with over there. And that's how we found out that phone call after years, the thing each other was dead. And we set up a reunion at, at uh, the VA clinic, and we met. And recognition was immediate even though we thought time had done its duty on our body, our bodies. But, uh, and it's been a very fruitful, wonderful friendship again. It was like fighting a lost brother. But I can't say enough about him and his abilities and coolness under combat. I mean, I've got the tremendous respect for him. But I do all of those guys. And um, it was just an honor, a, a really an honor to fly with this, this caliber of people. And it was a profound experience in my life. And, um, and in that regard, I'm glad it happened that I was able to meet such a wonderful group of guys.
And not, not only the pilots were fantastic guys, but the crews were too, the backseat guys. Uh, that was the door gunner and the crew chief. The crew chief took care of the aircraft, and the Army made a wise decision when he saw that that crew chief flew every mission with you. So he had a vested interest in seeing that every bolt was tightened down right, especially the Jesus nut. You can guess where that is. That holds the whole rotor system on, thus its name. And these guys were fantastic, too. And um, except when they th got a little wild with their M60s and threw hot brass down my neck, I didn't like that. <laughs> but that happens in the heat of combat. Another time, I uh, an M60 machine gun is one that fires about 550 <clears throat> rounds a minute. Or, and what what they say today, what you would use, you can overclock them to about 600, about 10 rounds a second, which is an awesome weapon. But the mini guns we had made those look like Daisy Pump single shot BB guns because the mini guns would could be cranked up in the jets to 6,000 rounds a minute apiece. It, think about that. Two of them, and that's 200 rounds a second. Now, we, we had them set for 2,400 rounds a minute apiece because our speed was slower than jet fighter aircraft, and it would have been overkill and a waste of ammo to have that kind of a <coughs> fire rate. And you could put a bullet in about every square foot with two M60s and a twenty and 2,400 rounds coming out of each side. They would only fire three seconds at a time and then kick off or the barrels would melt down. That's how hot they got. And uh, the... Yeah, I was uh, the uh, an M60 when it gets real hot. Uh, when you stop firing it, it has chambered another round, and it goes into that round in that chamber. And if that chamber is really hot, you can have what's called a cook off. The firing pin doesn't have to go; the heat discharges the bullet. Well, they're supposed to keep their. We had a new gunner one time. <clears throat> and I was flying aircraft commander, and we'd been scrambled. And that was one time I didn't put my flak vest and, chick and, and ceramic vest on, which would have probably protected me. But And you're in an armored seat. But anyway, he had that gun not pointed out the door, but pointed right at my back. He didn't mean to do it. And we'd just been in a firefight, and we were fighting for our lives, and I imagine his head was spinning. He was a new gunner. But anyway, his gun discharged and hit me right square between the shoulder blades and cracked a couple ribs right on the spot. And I lost my breath, fell forward, and the co-pilot got it. And had trouble getting my breath. I, I thought I'd been shot by a cannon, it felt like. And um, <clears throat> I had a little lecture for him after that flight. If it had been uh, a little bit higher, he would have taken my head off. But on the other hand, one day when I was, we, we had, Operation Wayne Gray in the play trap was one of the biggest f battles of the war that nobody hears anything about for some reason. <clears throat> we were trying to get a company of men out. Are you going to start another story? Let's, let's pause it. Um, let's 